Uh, good morning. So this morning, we're continuing this series on loving God with all that you are, your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And, and we, we've been looking at this, um, oh, the, the four quadrants of spiritual formation. And, and so this, this whole spiritual formation is a journey of formation. It's a, it's a continual formation where, where we are continually moving forward to become more and more transformed into Christ's likeness. And so uh, this is not a matter of, okay, when does salvation happen? Okay, now I need to stop. It's a, you know, salvation's the journey. Um, baptism brings about the Holy Spirit inside of us. And then we continue on a journey from baptism forward, and really a journey that leads up to baptism of desiring God, and then Holy Spirit being placed inside of us through baptism and then the Holy Spirit continues to work in us to bring about transformation into Christ's likeness. But this is not a static uh, transformation. This is not a passive transformation. This is an active engagement of transformation through the Spirit. And so we, we really want to talk about this as a church. And I was wanting to do this actually later in the year. But with, with everything going on in the world, more, more and more of you have kind of talked to me about how this has caused you to kind of reevaluate what's important in life. And when we reevaluate what's important, we have to look at what's on the throne of our hearts. We have to look at, look at our heart and say, okay, what's most important in my life? What, where is my heart focused? And so this morning, we're really going to look at uh, developing a heart for God. Uh, so kind of a recap of where we've been or the, the, the four quadrants, and I'm, quadrants is such a boring term, that I'm going to call them four types of spirituality. Uh, the spirituality of the mind, um, it's on this axis of, of what you, how you know God with your mind and how you know God with your heart, and the things you can know of God, and the things that are hidden about God, because God is bigger than all knowledge. And so the, the spirituality of the mind is God is revealed and can be known in scripture and in creation. And so we, we can see where God is working. We can know who God is if we examine scripture and we look around ourselves. Um, and then this goes over into uh, the spirituality of strength that we can know God with our mind or we, uh, we can know God uh, in his depths but we, there are things that are unknown about God. There are still unknown parts of God that are explored through simply just doing what the Bible says. We don't understand how God is putting these things into, into place, but we're going to love our neighbor as ourself sacrificially. We're going to lay down our life for others uh, sacrificially in a way that we don't understand God, but we know what we're called to do and we pursue that kind of action. And so loving God, uh, going, you know, counterclockwise around this circle, uh, we love God with our soul. There are unknown parts of God that we explore through our senses. Um, we explore them through silence and solitude and prayer, that what we know of God with our mind, we know that God is bigger. And so we go searching for who God is uh, in every way. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in weeks to come. But this morning, we're going to look at knowing God with our heart. God is revealed and can be known and felt through the senses. So this is different than knowing God with our mind, where we look at Scripture and say, boom, there it is. We know who God is uh, cognitively, or we know who God is through thinking well, through rationale. Uh, this is where you experience God with your senses, with your heart, you experience God uh, through the emotions. Uh, this is this is quite the journey, and and each of us are wired differently. Um, we're wired in one. I'm more wired towards the mind, honestly, and so I struggle sometimes with uh, contemplative prayer. And it's something I'm trying to develop in myself. Uh, and we don't want each of these. You know, while you may be wired more towards one, you need to develop the other three. Uh, in in the fullness, in full capacity to, to come to wholeness. And we, we see in Christ that he actually exists in each of these four uh, types of spirituality, that we see Jesus engaging in practices uh, that are found in all four of these spiritualities. And so in our transformation of Christ-likeness, 
we need to actually uh, develop all four of these. And so that's why we're going through this. So this morning, as we look at the spirituality of the heart, um, here's some things to know about kind of people from this part of spirituality. Or if, you, if you're naturally wired this way, um, these are some things that may ring true for you. But if you're not wired this way, here's some things you need to know. God is knowable, uh, but more through the heart than the head. Um, if God is love, the assumption is that he must be known through love, not simply known through ideas. Uh, theology and Bible study are still very important, um, but scripture also is the source of our knowing God with our hearts. Scripture helps shape our desire for God. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, how um, you don't just trust your emotions. You need, to, you need to back it up with scripture as well. Um, but also, you know, scripture needs to point us to our emotions. So all of these areas of spirituality actually go hand in hand. And what I'm hoping through this series is we recognize that as a church, we, we can actually see how we can live in harmony together and to help each other grow into Christ likeness. Because some of you who are more uh, emotive, who are more uh, in your worship of God through the heart, you, you stretch me and you help me to seek out love for God in different ways. And so we, we, find, each, we find ways to live in community together where we strive towards Christ's likeness. Um, for people in this type of spirituality, uh, personal holiness becomes the goal. Uh, this is popularized uh, you know, by Billy Graham. This is a personal walk with Jesus. And I have, I have some issues with personal walk with Jesus because personal walk with Jesus uh, needs to be lived out in community with others. It's not just about you and God. It's about you and God and you and your neighbor. And so how do you live out this personal walk with Jesus? And so that's one of the things we've got to talk about is it is a personal walk with Jesus, but your personal walk with Jesus is then lived out through the experiences with others. And so your walk with Jesus should always be lived out in community. Um, prayer is often, in, in this type of spirituality, prayer is often less formal. Uh, it's more spontaneous and exuberant. Um, I remember the first time I heard someone start a prayer with Daddy God, and it really threw me off because I, I was brought up more formal. Um, and there's, there's a need for both. I, I'm not going to say there's a right and a wrong here, which one's better, but we need to develop a, a more casual relationship with God. But we also need to recognize that he is the God who spoke all things into existence. And so uh, God is Father, but God is also God. And so we find um, areas of our life where we need to have less formal and spontane uh, spontaneity in prayer, but we also need to have time of reverence. And those don't have to be exclusive. Uh, so spirituality of the heart, people who are wired this way, um, they tend to experience God in the moment. Uh, they, re they revel in what is happening around them. Uh, they stay in the present and, you know, I didn't ask permission and I don't know if Cindy Leone's on, but I, I really see Cindy Leone or see this in Cindy Leone. When we're worshiping on Sunday, it doesn't matter what song it is. She is fully engaged. She's moving and, and she is worshiping God with all of her heart where I'm, I'm more up in my head thinking about, okay, what, what does this song say theologically? It's like, okay, I need to step towards Cindy a little bit there. Um, so these, these people tend to experience God in the moment, um, but they also experience, you know, great highs and deep lows in their relationship with God. Um, they have these mountaintop just, oh man, God is so good. My relationship is so full. And, but then they also have these deep, devastating lows in their relationship with God. And that's very natural because highs and lows in relationship bring balance. Uh, you can't have a relationship that's always high because the lows in the relationship actually bring meaning to those highs. And so there, there are times where, you know, Jesus in a matter of a week goes from the transfiguration, you know, where he is illuminated in the presence of God and with the presence of God. And then he's down in the garden saying, God, I, take this cup from me. And then he's on the cross saying, why have you forsaken me? 
And so, you know, you see this range of relationship in the life of Jesus. And so there, there are some dangers also in this spirituality that you need to remember that God is there, constantly there, even when you're not on a spiritual high. And so if you're one of the people that are wired this way, that like, I've got to have the next hit of highness for my spirituality to be real, you need to remember that even in the lows, God is with you. Ah, man, I can't remember the psalm. I should have looked this one up ahead of time. Um, but I love the psalm as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. And the beauty of that psalm, and there's a song that, that we sing that goes with that, uh, but the beauty of that psalm is as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, it also implies God is surrounding the valleys because the mountains are there and the valleys, and then there's Jerusalem. And so God is surrounding you on the mountaintop of Jerusalem, and he's surrounding you down in the valleys of Jerusalem. And so God is surrounding his people. And when you're in your lowest of lows, know that God is there. Um, and just because you feel strongly about something, this is another danger you got to watch out for. Just because you feel strongly about something does not mean it is from God. Um, we can trust our emotions too much and we can convince ourselves that all things are from God. This is where I, I want to say, come back to scripture and have good theology uh, and also surround yourself with community that when we test the spirits, as John, uh, 1 John 1, 4, verse 1 says, um, we actually come to the community and say, hey, does God want me to X, Y, Z? And and you have the community searching for God's voice in that as well. Uh, I've heard a lot of people um, who have said, you know, God just wants me to be happy. I feel that deep in my beings. Therefore, uh, I'm leaving my kids because they don't make me happy anymore. It's like, no, that's, that's not from God. Uh, that, that, is from, that is from someone else. Other than God, I'd say the devil, maybe, uh, or your unselfish desires, which is which is that tension. And so, um, the other danger here is that excessive emotionalism leads to pietism. And so, you you can kind of get into a place of I've had all of these spiritual highs that um, I've had all of these spiritual highs that if people aren't experiencing God the same way I am then they must not be spiritual. And you become uh, a little bit pious in a way that, that people start to, uh, or you start to look down on other people who don't experience God the same way you do. So do not fail to recognize the spiritual experience of others just because they're not as expressive. Um, some people are very expressive in their worship. Others are not. I've, I've heard so many people in a worship service say, this church obviously doesn't love God because they don't. They're, they're just not expressive. Well, that's just, that's just not true. And there's just different ways. So we can become a little bit overly pious by saying, look at how spiritual I am because I've had these long wake or, uh, sleepless nights of prayer. Uh, because God and I are just so close. And so we got to be careful of those things. So these are some of the dangers. But I want to, oh yeah, and the other is, you know, don't judge other congregations because congregations kind of take on a spirituality. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's congregations that have incredible uh, worship with their songs, but they're depleted theologically and their doctrine is shallow. Uh, and then there's others that are so like doctrine heavy and they're, they, they read the Bible and they know the Bible well, but they don't have an ounce of the spirit in them. There's no joy. And so we, we can't judge other congregations and other people, but how do we learn from them? How do we say, how do we create a place where everybody is welcome? And, and at the end of this lesson, I'm going to talk about some kind of practical implications on how to put some of this into practice and how to develop this spirituality. Uh, I want to come back to the passage that Blair read for us. And he's already read this uh, story for us. I'm not going to reread the whole thing, but when we focus on the prodigal son, we focus on the younger son, the one who went away. But the, the passage I want to look at in this 
is the older son because if you if you read this story uh, thoughtfully and you read it over and over again, you start to see that this is really a story of two prodigal sons, two sons that the father has to go out to and invite in. And so I want to look at the older son and reread this passage at the end. It says, meanwhile, while the party is going on inside celebrating the, the coming home, the return of the younger son, the older son was in the field. And when the father came, or no, when the older son came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. He says, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. Before he answered his father, before, uh, but he answered his father, look, all these years I have, I have been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have, everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And I want to focus on these last words um, of the father to the older son. I want to go back to this. He says, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. And, and that, that continues to just stay with me in this passage, that if the older son knew his father, he would be looking down the road for his brother as well. He might have even left home to go find him. But he's so focused on what he gets. He's so focused on what he deserves, what is rightfully his, that he never actually knew the father. He was near the father in proximity, but he never knew the father with his heart. He knew what was rightfully his with his mind, but he never knew the father with his heart. And so I want to look some more at scripture uh, as we kind of keep this, hold this story in your heart. As we, as we look at some more scripture, that you know, Philippians chapter 3, 10 and 11, Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. But, you know, Paul is at the end of his life in this passage. He says, oh, man. I've been pursuing Jesus and all I want at the end of the day, all I want is to know Christ. In, in John chapter 1, uh, 9 through 13, it's talking about, you know, Jesus is the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And, and then he uses this metaphor of light in verse 9, it says the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or nor of a husband's decision or a husband or of human decision or a husband's will, but they're born of God. I, I, I point to this passage because it talks about Jesus is the light. He's the one that illuminates everything. He's the one that gives light to who God is. He's the one we look to. He's the one that everything was created through him. And when he came to creation, they didn't recognize him or receive him. And so there's a certain blindness that we have when it comes to Christ. And we find ourselves often like the older brother who just may be in proximity, but just doesn't even know. And so we, we come to James chapter 1, 13 and 15. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, uh, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so, you know, church, I, I want to ask you, what, what are you desiring? What's your deepest desires? And this is, a, this is a question that we have to wrestle with. And when Jesus says, what, what can I do for you? What do you want? He's asking us very plainly, what is the desire of your heart? And if our desire isn't God, then, then sin begins to be born in us. And when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. And so we have to continually be checking our desires. Because when we desire something other than God, we do everything we can to protect it. But when our desire is for God, we, we develop a heart of God. And we, we look to protect those that God protects. So James points to this desire in our heart and our blindness to the light that is Jesus. Um, that we... we that this desire takes root in us and grows into death. Uh, St. Augustine, uh, from the book Confessions, uh, this is his autobiography, and he talks about how he just has these desires. He stole pears from a neighbor's pear tree when he was a kid because he wanted to. It wasn't because the pears were any better. It was, and he had pears on his own, on his own uh, land, but he just said, I'm the master of my own soul. I can do this. And so through, all throughout his confessions, he talks about his desires. And this one line has stuck with me for years. It says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And this restless heart, uh, we, we search after all kinds of things in this world and none of them fill us. No amount of wealth, no amount of um, sexual relationships, no amount of experiences, no amount of anything can fill us and can really fulfill our desires. So our heart is restless until it rests in you. And so when you, when you find yourself restless, you have to stop and examine your heart and say, okay, where's my heart pointing to? Is it God or something else? And so this is the, the passage uh, that, that really brings everything together. Um, and I, I'm using this translation. I don't even remember which one it is because I, I like the word abide here. But in John 15, uh, 1 through 12, it says, I am the true vine. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm the true vine and my father is, is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it will bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And, and I want to stop there for a minute because we, we focus so much on, okay, if you're not bearing fruit, then you're going to be taken away and thrown to hell. And there's, there's some of that in this passage, but the, the real heart of this passage is this part of verse four. It's not about bearing fruit. It's about abiding. He says, abide in me and I in you. Uh, rest in me. Take comfort in me because I'm also in you through the Spirit. As the branch cannot bear fruit of, its, of, its, uh, of itself unless it ab abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as, as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And the reason I say this isn't, this passage isn't so much about bearing fruit. That is the outcome. This passage is about abiding in Jesus. Because it's abiding in Jesus, that fruit produces. And so we come up with uh, these plans and schemes of, okay, how do, we, how do we bear fruit? How do we reach the loss? How do we change? How do we transform? And the simple 
fact of the matter is, is how are you resting in the presence of God daily? And out of that, fruit will develop. And we keep reading in this passage that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you love my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is my commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. And so I come back to that that teaching early on that you can't just have a walk with Jesus. It also has to be lived out in community. That if the way of Jesus is a way of love, then, then the community of believers is the place where love is enacted. And so we, we learn to love one another so that we can then go out and love the world. And so it's not just about, okay, how do I spend time with Jesus by myself? It's about how do I spend time with Jesus in such a way that I then go bear fruit and share it with my neighbor. And so we, we, keep, we keep wrestling with this. What does it mean to ab- abide in me and I in you? Uh, I love this quote from Henry Now, and he actually has got um, a lot of great uh, quotes about abiding with Jesus. And uh, I really recommend the book, uh, the, Pro- the Return of the Prodigal by Henry Now, and which is uh, his reflections on Rembrandt's painting. But anyways, this, this passage, or this, um, this quote from him, I want to talk about for a minute. It says, I deeply know that I have a home in Jesus, just as Jesus has a home in God. I know too that when I abide in Jesus, I abide with him in God. Those who love me, Jesus says, will be loved by my Father. John 14, 21. My true spiritual work is to let myself be loved fully and completely. And to trust that in that love, I will come to the fulfillment of my vocation. I keep trying to bring my wandering, restless, and anxious self home so that I can rest there in the embrace of love. And the reason I share this this quote from Henry Nouwen is, is because he talks about being home with Jesus. That often in this world, uh, we, we don't feel like we're at home because this world is just so messed up. Uh, and we try to find our, our, our home here through, through business and through, through making money, through having relationships. And we try to find our home here in so many different ways, but we have to be able to retreat from this place and enter into the presence of God to simply be at home with God. Uh, and what that means is to, to actually sit in God's love, knowing fully that you were loved by God and knowing what it means to be loved by God. And we've got to explore that more. What does it mean to know fully that you're loved by God, that there's nothing you can do in this life that will make God love you less? And there's nothing you can do in this life that will make God love you more, because God's love is so perfect for you that you can rest in God's presence and just be with the Father. And so that I, I want to help us on this journey, and we need to help each other on this journey to abide in Christ. And then, and only then, will we start to see fruit. And so I, I'm going to come back to this passage later. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over it. But I, I want to introduce us to a few practices, and we're going to dwell in the Word together on Mark chapter 10 um, after we have a song. As we prepare for communion, we'll 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 look at this passage again. I want to teach us a different kind of reading that's helpful for this kind of spirituality. So the spirituality of the heart, how do you develop uh, the spirituality of the heart? Find worship music that moves you into praise. Um, That's going to look different for each of us. Uh, some, Some people will go listen to Bach. Uh, we'll go listen to Beethoven and the great symphonies because the way they speak about the love of God and the way the music moves you, that's going to bring you into praise. Some people are going to look for more contemporary worship. 
Uh, others may look for the old hymns. Others are going to look for songs that just repeat themselves over and over again because it actually creates a rhythm in life. Um, this, is, this looks different for all of us. And as a church, when we come together for worship, we're actually worshiping in a way that, that we, all, we all enter into praise. And we can't provide worship that fits every person's needs. And so when we worship together, it's actually a time where we're looking to the interest of others and not our own interests. So do this on your own. Find worship music that moves you into praise, that you can, that you can praise from the heart with it. Uh, and do that in your own time, because it's not just something you do on Sunday. Sunday is for edifying one another. Uh, regularly share stories of your relationship with God. Um, community, uh, you know, loving God with your heart is something to be shared. Uh, so, you know, find someone that you can share it with. You know, talk about, you know, what you, what God is doing in your life, where you saw God during the day, etc. You know, someone that you call once a week or once a month and just say, hey, let's just talk about what God's doing in our lives. How would that be encouraging to you and how would that be encouraging to them? And, and next week, we'll talk more about the communal benefits, the benefits of the community for the spirituality of the heart. Right now, we're mostly focused on the internal benefits. Um, one way of doing this is also keeping a journal that's honest about your relationship with God. If you're in a high, talk to God about it through a journal. Write it out use common language. When, when you're in a deep low, cry out to God in your journal. Talk to God about where he is. Uh, a great model for this, if you're looking for a model, go read the Psalms. The Psalms are just outpouring of relationship with God, and they're, they're deeply from the heart of David and the other Psalm writers. Um, you can use devotional books, which engage the heart. Um, for a lot of my immaturity in my spiritual formation, I've often looked at devotional books as shallow and simplistic. Um, I repent of that because I wanted a commentary because I spent too much time in my mind. And I'm trying to find ways to get deeper into my heart um, and loving God through, devo you know, these devotional books are helpful. So here's a couple of devotional resources that might be helpful for you. Um, our women's Bible study did Experiencing God. And I, my goodness, I have heard them talk about this book so much. At some point, I'm going to read it because they've talked about how impactful it's been. Um, how do you live life in a way that you experience God every day? Uh, Anna Rule, who used to be part of our church, she read this book and it actually led to a career change for her. She wanted to do things that brought her more into the presence of God. And so now she lives in Cincinnati and um, and we, we miss her, but, but it's when you finally open yourself up to relationship with God, and especially in a community like the Women's Bible Study, uh, this was a great one for them. Uh, I'll read it at some point. Uh, Live in Grace, Walk in Love, a 365-day journey with Bob Goff. Uh, Bob Goff is a great storyteller. He'll help you fall in love with God and, and Jesus in different ways. And so Bob Goff's a good one for that. Um, you know, one of my heroes, Henry Nouwen, uh, really read anything by him, but this book, Following Jesus, uh, find, Finding Our Way Home in an Age of Anxiety. Uh, when is the age of anxiety? The answer is now. We, we are an anxious people, and which tells me we've got to spend more time with Jesus um, and to abide in the love of God. Uh, and this last one is, is one that I'm starting to dabble in, but some friends that I, I trust, um, they, they talk about this book all the time. Uh, this one's for kids, uh, but it's good for adults as well, but it's called Imaginative Prayer. It's, it's from um, the Jesuit tradition uh, from a guy named Ignatius 500 years ago, that it's a way of praying scripture uh, that you use your imagination. And, and they talk about, they did studies on this where they got kids, instead of reading scripture for the facts, instead of reading scriptures for, okay, here are the answers to the questions, they got kids to start engaging their imaginations and to experience the love of God more deeply. And one of the stories in it is a kid uh, reading the story of the, uh, of the lame man who is lowered down through the roof by his four friends. And they kind of walked him through this imaginative prayer. And this kid had like severe ADD. And so sitting down and just doing a Bible study was near impossible. 
but getting him to en engage his imagination helped him interact with the text in a deeper way. And, you know, they would ask questions like, well, how does it feel to have your friends carrying you? And, you know, kind of getting into that discomfort and what does it feel like to be lowered through a roof and using your imagination to pray through that and say, okay, what does it feel like to, uh, to be lowered through a roof in front of everyone? And then Jesus looks at you and says, your sins are forgiven. And engaging with that as a child uh, through the imagination, that this kid who um, you know, normally struggled to sit through any Bible studies broke down in tears because he felt the love of Jesus in a more tangible way than just simply uh, reading the Bible with his mind. So the imagination kind of brings us into uh, ways of interacting with the text through our heart. And so um, you, you can do this with other, other passages. Uh, you can do imaginative prayer. The spirituality of the heart kind of takes us into using the other senses that what, what we do is, um, you know, God gave us these senses. And so we engage with God through the senses. And so you, here's the basic steps. You read a story from the Gospels and place yourself within the story. Um, you can pick a character and read it from that character's perspective. But while you read it, you, you stop and you use your imagination and you engage the senses. Um, what do you see as that character? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? What do you touch or feel? And, and as you do this, um, you're going to spend more time with each of the senses in some stories than you do with others. But, but just allow your senses to kind of guide you into the text and place you within the story. So how do you experience the scene from that character? Uh, and I want to invite us to do this in a small way. Whenever we have our time of dwelling in the word, um, think about these different steps and place yourself within the story of Bartimaeus, uh, the blind man, and, and experience that story just allowing you to sit with him, feel the dirt uh, on the ground. You've been sitting there day after day. How dirty do you feel? You've got the crowd around you. What's the noise like? Uh, what's the noise like as you hear the commotion? And, and you know that Jesus is there, and so you start to yell out, you know, Lord Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner, and, or have mercy on me. And, and you're yelling out, and people are telling you to be quiet. What does that feel like for people to tell you to be quiet? And then finally, Jesus says, come. What does it feel like to throw your cloak aside and to run to Jesus? What does it feel like for Jesus, Jesus to say, what do you want? And what does, it, what does it feel like to actually open your eyes and to see for the first time? And so as we read the story, uh, allow your imagination to roam a bit. Now, we're not going to spend uh, a ton of time with the story to do that, but I, I want to free you to kind of do that and to share your experience with it. Or if you just want to um, kind of do what we do every week and just listen to what God is telling you through the story, that, that's good too. But you can use this story and also do the whole thing from the perspective of the people on the street who, who tell the guy to be quiet, who tell Bartimaeus to be quiet. There's a lot of ways to do this. Um, but this, is, this has been a helpful practice for me to, to get out of the rigors of biblical studies that I'm in on a regular basis and to actually interact with the text in a way that helps me know Jesus. And so church, I, I want to invite us as we prepare to do this, uh, let's, let's sing a song together.